Awesome. Welcome, everybody, to another one of Entry Level's uh, event on uh, Ask a CEO Anything. And uh, today we have with us uh, AJ Prakash, who is the CEO and founder of Entry Level. Before we dive deep into and ask uh, a lot of questions with AJ, I would love for everyone to put in the chat where you are joining from, which city, which country you're joining from, so we can see uh, where's everybody in the room from. Uh, I'll start with where I am from. I'm joining from Nairobi in Kenya. Cape Town in Germany, nice. We have folks from Singapore, Delhi, Hong Kong, Bangalore, Durban. Wow, nice. It's a pretty big spread. It's awesome. Yeah, amazing. All right, I would also encourage for whoever uh, can to turn on your videos because this is an interactive session. So you don't need to keep your videos off. And if you'd like, you can also ask questions. Well, you can request to unmute and uh, you can ask questions. I'll allow that option uh, soon. Once I, I'll start with the questions you guys submitted when signing up. And then if you'd like, we can have a, a conversation uh, uh, with AJ. Now, the next thing we're going to do is uh, a small poll just to see the two question poll, which I'm going to launch now, which you'll see pop up on your screen. There's two questions. How are you feeling today? And uh, if, have you done an entry level course before? So I just want to know who's, who's a student and who's a prospective student. Awesome. I see nine people have answered. Everyone's answering. Amazing. Brilliant. Uh, I'm glad no one's confused. <laughs> Some nervous people though. <laughs> Aisha, I think you're too intimidating. <laughs> All right. Well, I see majority are pumped and excited. So yes, this is going to be an exciting event. Uh, and I see almost 60% of people have done a course and uh, some that haven't done a course with entry level before. Wonderful. That's just right. our market research. So I appreciate you guys filling it up. So we, we know. <laughs> awesome. Thanks everyone for uh, filling that poll. I'm gonna end that now. Brilliant. Couple of, uh, oh, is it sharing the results? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Wonderful. So to kick start, uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, not many, just no spamming the chat and uh, um, that's it. And we, we all are here to learn and uh, have a discussion. So let's keep it civil. And uh, if you have any questions regarding the program or any program that you've done, you are free to message us on the chat and we'll see if we can answer that today. And uh, for those who are new to entry level, just um, AJ is going to give a better introduction of entry level because, well, he founded the company. Uh, and we're going to start with that, his motivations for that. But for those who are uh, uh, new here, um, you probably are subscribed to our newsletters and are receiving our updates. We offer a bunch of uh, a lots of upskilling programs that uh, give you an experience in the real field. Um, we have programs in VC analyst, financial analyst, product management, data analyst, and um, a couple of programs in digital marketing and Scrum Master. And uh, our portfolio of programs is growing. Our programs are free if you finish. So whoever finishes the program and submits the portfolio has a chance to get uh, the refund back and actually building uh, a portfolio through your course. So it's very experiential. Now, I'm not going to keep talking about entry level and uh, the programs because we want to know more about more about Ajay and uh, more about what he does. So I'm going to kick start with a couple of questions. But if any of you uh, have any questions, meanwhile, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, there's a raise hand option uh, right in. I think you just uh, you'll see it. Uh, 
I can't see it because I'm the host, but uh, it's it's there in the participants field where you uh, write in the chat. So you can raise your hand and uh, we will uh, unmute you and you can ask a question there. Yeah, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a reactions button with a smiley face and plus you click that and then raise hand. Perfect. Wonderful. Uh, so AJ, let's, so we know you as the CEO and uh, founder of Entry Level, but we'd like to know a little bit more about you. Can you uh, uh, give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself? Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you did in the past and uh, what you're doing now. Yeah, for sure. So in the past, I guess, started off as a theoretical physicist slash manufacturing engineering, which has nothing to do with what I'm doing today, but that's where I started in university. And then um, I started a bunch of different companies, to be honest, I was just throwing darts. So I did a beer company for a bit, tried quantum computing, tried various different things. Um, I also started a nonprofit in uh, my second year of university helping engineers reskill. So we did that for free. It was called Real Skills in Sydney. And we reskilled about 8,000 engineers free of charge to, you know, find better jobs, essentially. Because in Australia, there was this whole issue where, like, people were graduating from engineering degrees that just had no um, job prospects. And so we were trying to fix that. So my, my heart has always been in the education space. And so, you know, after going through the trials and tribulations of starting a few companies, I did an international trade company in Singapore for a number of years. And, you know, we raised a bunch of capital. We grew the team from zero to you know, 120, 130 people. Um, and so I've gone through those different pitfalls, but I always come back to the education space. And so in 2020, you know, COVID hit and it was like prime time for education. Transparently, it was just like a timing issue and like a um, opportunistic thing. So I've always wanted to start it, but 2020 just seemed like the right time to start an edtech company. So that's quite frankly, the reason why we started in that period of time. Awesome. Um, you've been you've been following the entrepreneurial path for a while. What made you decide that you wanted to be the boss? You wanted to pursue this journey and not not work for someone else. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I started with the intention of becoming a professor. So I wanted to become a pro physics professor and sort of uh, teach. But then I realized the real impact was being made not in the laboratory in the university, but actually by entrepreneurs paving their own, paving their own pathway. And so um, I did work for a couple of companies here and there, but I was always doing something on the side. And so I just realized that, um, you know, and it sounds weird because we reskill people into jobs, but I feel that I wanted my work to be unbounded. So I didn't want there to be a bit of a, um, a cap to my work, right? Like you get paid your salary and you do your work, and I, there was often times where I'd go above and beyond for my work and then go to go to my boss and sort of explain to them what they what I did. And they're like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> and then like, there's no reaction, there's no reward for that. And I just sort of said, you know, that's not really what I wanna do. Like I wanna do my own thing. But I also think there's ways to incorporate that into the employment experience, right? But for example, like at entry level, as you know, like everyone gets stock options and I try to make everyone feel like an owner in some capacity. and so. There's ways to do it, like where you don't have to become an entrepreneur. And I'm not saying that that's the only pathway, but some of the advice I give to early entrepreneurs is like, maybe join an early stage company that's raised a bit more com capital and like has a bit more, less risk involved and where you can still get equity, right? So you still get paid and you get equity. It's like best of both worlds in some cases. So um, personally, I just enjoy the playing the game, right? Like, like trying and building something really interesting and changing the world in some capacity. And, um, you know, we make mistakes here and there and, um, but we're trying our best, right? Like, and I think people believe in what we're trying to do in the team and we're trying to make a difference. Um, and so, yeah, I enjoy that. Absolutely. Great answer. So in your past, you ventured into spaces that are uh, a bit different from education, like I think FNB as well and, uh, blockchain. So, what are your thoughts on this uh, Adesh, jack of all trades, master of none, applied in an entrepreneurial field? What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, so in engineering, there's this concept called robustness, right? Like, and robustness basically means that like you can persevere and 
um, adapt to various different scenarios and different things that are happening, right? And uh, if, you, if you take a material and put it in a different environment, it has to be robust. And so if you think about yourself in, in terms of the skill sets you have and you're not robust where you could be put in a different environment or maybe the market conditions change. And, you know, we saw from COVID, which is probably the most clear example where everything went online. And so people with more hospitality skill sets or in-person skill sets were sort of skilled out, right? Um, and now we're seeing a different shift, right? Where the economy is sort of shifting the other way. And now tech companies are doing layoffs and hospitality companies are struggling to get people through the door. And so um, the reason why I, you know, worked as a full stack developer, worked an operation manager um, and did various different things is because like, I wanted to build my robustness. So I wanted to build my growth skill set. I wanted to build my developer skill set, my operation skill set, so on and so forth. So um, I think I've done a decent job of becoming robust and you know, building robustness sometimes means you trade off and becoming a specialist. So um, there are some people that are world class in one particular thing and have built that particular skill set, and other people who have like sort of built a various skill set, so they're more defensible, right? But also in that defensibility, there becomes this Venn diagram of skills that sort of overlap, and you can become world class. For example, you know, you could be world class, you could be good at copywriting, and you could be good at artificial intelligence, and that Venn diagram that the sort of area between those two things means that you could be a, an amazing copywriter for artificial intelligence, which, you know, there's way less people doing. So um, I, I think because of that, I, I have the unique skill sets to build this particular company, right? Because of the experience and growth, the experience in building products and the education experience. So um, that's why I feel like starting an ed tech company was like perfect for me personally, but uh, it really depends on your journey and what you're doing. Right. So when you when you get like ideas, entrepreneurial ideas, or a business, or even in, even in entry level, if you have ideas of side business or like something else we can do, how do you know if your idea is worth it and what what personally do what do you do to validate these ideas? Yeah. So I think about it very experimentally, right? And so we we I've invested in a couple of different entrepreneurs now this year and last year, and so you know what I can say is that. Me personally, and I like also prefer entrepreneurs like this that are, like try many different things, right? You fall in love with the problem that you're trying to solve and not this like weird solution that you have. And you're trying different angles to solve that problem and throwing darts to see what works, right? So when we launched entry level, I actually launched like nine other things at the same time. No one hears about it because I just sort of sweep it under the rug. But, you know, we launched future proof, we launched virtual coaching, we've launched all these different things, right? And you know, it's just that entry level worked out, right? It, we had 7,000 signups in the first week. And we're like, okay, that's interesting. Let's dig into that, right? But ultimately the problem I was trying to solve was around education and recruitment. Um, and so we're still working on the recruitment piece. We haven't got to that yet. Focus on the education side, still trying to fix various things there. Then we'll sort of build out the recruitment side of things. But um, yeah, yeah, it was just opportunistic and, and experimental. And then we hit a point right? Where entry level was working, we're rescaling people, but we we're doing a hundred percent for free. And we said, okay, we don't have a business model. So we're going to run out of money very soon. Um, and so we just tried various different business models from anywhere from sponsorships to companies coming in and helping out to, you know, this, this commitment bond thing that we tried, right? Which um, when I pitched it to the team, they thought it was a stupid idea, which, you know, it, it did seem like it at the time, but then we did it. And then we realized, okay, how do we then have an upsell loop at the end so we can keep some of the bonds at the end of it? And now we've created a bit of a sustainable loop that makes sense. So um, it, it's all experimental. And even now we're hitting issues, right? So we're, we're trialing different marketing tactics. I know in programs, we're testing things rapidly. We, um, you know, we, we are rehauling the Scrum Master program, right? Because like, you know, we got some feedback and we decided to rehaul it. So it's currently on waiting list if you go look at that. So there's various things we're testing and trying and uh, improving on. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, like on, on ideas, like I, what you said was really resonating with me, falling in love with the problem as well, because uh, I, I'm doing a course myself on the side here and, uh, and I'm with, uh, our focus right now is understanding the problem. And it's like doing so much sensing and so much uh, so many interviews and using different tools to understand what the problem actually is and then coming up with a bunch of ideas and for the person who asked this question how do you validate ideas 
um, check out our product management program <laughs> because we have a whole uh, module there on uh, validation on like how do you validate I, like how do you validate the problem that you have uh, how do you validate if there's a demand for the solution that you're thinking and how to actually validate uh, the ideas by using different methods and uh, at the end it's about um, experimenting uh, right there's a couple of uh rubber. yes we have noted that feedback we received that feedback via email too and we are in the process of rehauling the scrum master program thanks for yeah we should have let you know we um no we definitely took your suggestion seriously we, we it's currently on wait list now so we're revamping the entire thing so no i really appreciate that feedback and we definitely are listening it's just that sometimes we, we didn't get back to you and letting you know that that's what we did and the actionables but yeah don't worry we're on it Awesome. Ash wants to ask a question, so I'm going to uh, let you unmute. Hi, Ajay. Thank you so much for taking your time out. My name is Ash. I am working on, I know you like the background. I uh, <laughs> you knew exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm working on an education platform. It's called Mad Ed, where we, what we are doing is we are tying up with colleges and universities in DR2 and India, right? And then we are educating them about Web3 and Game3. So we are creating the world's what we call the first community management program. So I am not worried about the success of the thing. The idea is how efficiently can we get successful? So I have got everything sorted out. We have partnerships in more than 20 universities and colleges giving us access to 40,000. And this is just first month. We are like in first month. So we've got 40,000 students that are already willing to onboard. And we have the companies who are willing to hire them if they go through a program and the way we do it. The one thing that I'm worried about is how efficiently I can make it and the culture setting within the company because I'm pretty young, right? I'm 26. I've tried working with like more than 11 companies still out, succeeded at a lot of things, failed at a lot of things. So I'm just very worried about how to actually set the culture in the company, right? Where the values get aligned in the long term. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, how, how big is the team now for, for you guys? Uh, right now, we're just five people. We, we, it's, it's not even been a month that, you know, we have actually started out. So we, we have just been very passionate, just going out, putting, you know, meeting everybody in like in the sense of, you know, offline marketing and everything. We go out and meet all the universities and colleges. We even go out and do free sessions so they can sort of get the taste of what we're trying to achieve with them. So, yeah. yeah. So the question is about building culture within the team of five people, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's an interesting one. We, um, you know, we're not that big either. I think we're, we're closing in on 15 people. So we're only a few steps ahead. And I don't actually like hiring more people because I like keeping the team as lean as possible and um, also conserves our cash flow. And it's very uncertain what's happening economically. So, you know, I'm not going to splurge on hiring too many people right now. But um, look, we learned very quickly that like um, in a small team, uh, it's pretty easy to set culture just because like it, it comes from the founder and it comes from just like having these one-on-one -on -one com conversations. It's just that when you start growing the team, uh, you can't have those one-on-one -on -one conversations as much, right? And there's um, the culture has to be set like um, from the way that you talk to each other, the way that team members interact with each other. So, um, you know, we've done these culture setting sessions where we set out co corporate values and we set our mission and vision, but ultimately like, I think there's more things that are more fundamentally important about like things like, you know, how do we work as a team? Like, are we doing goals? Are we doing um, OKRs? Like, are we doing these various structures for the team? Um, and it, I, I also found that like people actually want more direction than they say they do, right? A lot of people like autonomy, right? They say they want autonomous structures and things like that, but then you let them do their thing and you sort of step back for a bit and then everyone's just confused on what's going on. And so they actually like direction. They like being told like, these are the goals, right? Um, so I think one thing that I'll say is like for the culture side of things, like I wouldn't worry too much about like, you know, pushing a particular culture, right? The culture will form around the team. And I think at five people, people will figure out exactly the right ways to work with each other, right? And you can codify some aspects of it, right? Um, and then the second thing I'll say is like, the, the autonomous versus heavy direction problem, I think is one of the biggest ones as you sort of scale the team up. Um, and I think where I've landed at is like, be very uh, pushy on goals and like the, the OKRs and things like that and be really like uh, top down when it comes to goals. Like this is exactly what I expect from you. Um, but then in terms of how they achieve those goals, you let your team have autonomy. Okay, all right, that, that sounds good enough. Yeah.
Is there anything specific around the culture stuff that you want to me to answer? No, no, no. So I, the way we are going, I am pretty sure we're going to do pretty well. So, you know, there are two ways you look for things that would work out. I'm looking for things that might not work. I'm trying to just remove everything possible. So I'm very much worried about the efficiency of things rather than things failing. So we have tried a lot of things. I'm not scared of pivoting. I can, you know, pivot anything, anytime. Very flexible in that sense. I'm just sort of worried that if we go too fast, I don't want that to be the problem rather than anything else, right? So that, that's something that I'm very much worried about that we go in a right place. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, it, it's very difficult to figure out all the things that could go wrong, right? And so, yeah. you know, you can plan for it, but unfortunately, like, there's, you know, everything can happen. So, so it's just, yeah. Yeah, so I'm happy to feel. It's just, you know, I'm going to do my best, you know. The outcome is irrelevant as long as I'm putting the 100% effort. That's the idea. Awesome. Best of luck. Sounds awesome. Thanks. Um, just a second. Um, a couple of messages in the chat. If you have any plans to start a Rust system programming course. Wait, where did you, is that high up? Yeah. Okay, so Rust, I, I love Rust. I think Rust is awesome. Um, I think it's a very like, specific language right but it's very nice language right so i, I think um it's something we want to do but unfortunately as much as i want to do programs for things that i think are exciting we just have to go where demand is and like not enough people have like said we want a rust course for us to go like invest the resources and time and effort to build a rust course so yeah that's my unfortunate answer i'd be very excited to do a rust course um and to be honest if the right mentor comes to us and like will come work with us to do it in a very efficient way, then, you know, we're not opposed to it. Yeah, I learned something new today. I didn't even know Rust. There was a programming language called Rust. Rust is there's a lot of these, like, I wouldn't say Rust is that niche, but they're very, like, there's a lot of these niche languages that are out there um, that are cool in different ways. Yeah. All right, we have to, uh, I mean, Jeffrey mentioned that he, he thinks we can still do a virtual coaching within within our programs where people can subscribe to coaching session. And then Mark asked as well, would we consider uh, launching a mentorship program? Because having a good mentor is important for new people like, who are transitioning to new industries or like new in the industry. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so on the coaching thing, we tried that. It didn't work as well as I would have hoped. Like we... But the issue is like just the economics around running that, right? Like it's uh, it's pricey to pay a mentor and then you got to make sure that the people are willing to pay for it. And unfortunately, people aren't as willing to pay for coaches as, as they are for like fitness and things like that. So that was our initial launch. Maybe maybe we need to try it again, but that we did that maybe a year ago. It didn't pan out. Um, on the mentoring thing, I think so. Like, the, I think having mentors is super important. It's just that like ADP list does this for free, right? So, you know, they're one of our partner companies. So if you're interested, you can check out this is a free promo for ADP list, but you know, they, they have free mentors accessible for you. So you can just go there and book a mentor anytime you want. Um, so there's no point in us rebuilding the wheel, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, awesome. What, what challenges, uh, like moving on to some questions from the which was submitted earlier. What challenges have you faced like in the first six to eight months of launching entry level? Challenges, six to eight months. So the first um, first three months was I had no idea what we were building. Like it was just Renee and uh, Caleb and myself sitting in my mom's uh, dining room just because I moved back home to like conserve money because I didn't want to waste uh, investor money. So I just moved back home to like, <laughs> until I was like, I set myself a goal. I was like, I'm not going to move back out until I figure out exactly what I'm building. Um, and so I, I decided to do that. So we're just trying things. And I think the first three months, I had no idea what we were building. And then I'd, I'd say month four, we figured out entry level was the thing. And then the second thing was like, we had so much demand. We had like 30, 40,000 people coming through our courses and we had no idea how to make money. So we're just running these free programs. And so um, the second stress that was keeping me up at night was like, we had <laughs> we didn't know how to make money. So um, yeah, those are the two biggest issues. But ultimately I look back at those times and there was like fun problems to solve. And 
now the problems are a little bit more nuanced and uh you know not as not as they are interesting but they're interesting in a different way i would say like i like the the zero to one phase it's fun awesome wonderful uh emmanuel asked uh, maybe i can just quickly answer this would you consider projects for newbies to enhance efficiency in the field so i mean how the courses are designed is that you actually work on a project but what we recommend is not to stop there because you can build on those projects and whether it's data analyst you can just find data online and work on your own and create your own projects same for ux design vc and product management you can just pick an existing company and revamp some of their like website or app and show what you've done and why you did it so it's um, the courses are include projects within them but then you can always uh, pick up side projects yourself and uh, enhance your skills Weber, I think there's heaps of ways uh, just to add to that I think there's heaps of ways to find projects like as I usually said you can find stuff online to do like you know you just find your own data project and publish and talk about it I think writing about what you do is really important so publishing on LinkedIn um, honestly, if you if you work on a project and publish on LinkedIn and tag me, I'll have a look at it and I'll share it. Right, like there's there's ways to get it out there, um, and I always find it fascinating when people take the effort to go do things. So um, I've seen projects where someone has redesigned a website that they thought was poor, and they went and did it for their UX portfolio and said like, "This is how I'd redesign this anime website that I saw," and I was like, "That's really cool." Um, so there's ways to like go about it. I also saw someone who built a portfolio because they were applying for a job at Canva. So they did Canva as a project and they like analyzed different aspects of Canva or this particular feature and they used that as part of the application process. Um, so yeah, uh, these things work. Like uh, that's, that's definitely something I've done in the past as well. So just finding these things and you can use existing companies and as long as you're not monetizing it and you're just using it for your learning, there's nothing wrong with like using them as a um, little bit of a project for you to work off. Awesome. Uh, more of a job search question. Weber asked that he's finished product management program, level one and Scrum Master as well, but it's still hard to find a entry level job. So uh, any tips on how to how to go ahead with that? Yeah, so that one's a tricky one. It's it, it's definitely a tough market out there. Um, and it's even harder for entry level people because, um, you know, the courses aren't necessarily going to be the only thing helping you get that job. One thing I found, and this is just my personal tip and whether it works for you is, is um, a different question. When I was getting jobs at an early stage and I didn't have any experience, what I did was so I was going for a marketing position. Um, and so before I went for that interview, I knew I had no skills. So I went and built them a marketing report. So I went and did research on the company. I redesigned their web page and I did like a bunch of work and I printed it out and I showed them what I did on the interview. And then he was so impressed, he hired me the next day. So I, I think there's ways to showcase your experience in a different way when you don't have it, right? So um, taking the initiative where like, um, you know, you, you build something for them or you analyze that feature and say, okay, this is where your conversion rate is low um, and try to do the job to de-risk the hire for them. Because ultimately, right, what you got to think about is that hiring is an exchange of value, right? They're paying you X amount of dollars for, for some service, right? And if you think about that in the normal world, when I pay for a service, I expect out of the box production, I expect you to do the service perfectly and I give you this much money and it's great. When it comes to entry level talent, there's a bit of a blurred line between like, okay, I'm paying you X amount, but I also have the understanding that you kind of have to learn to like figure out the skills and things like that. And there might be some trade-off period before you provide that value. And, it, and when, it, when it comes to these times where people are less certain about the economy and things like that, even last year was still tough, but um, people are less interested in investing that time and effort. So the more that you can do to de-risk the hire, so you prove that you can do the job, prove that you can provide some like benefit to the company in some way, the better you are, right? So... And then I say that knowing full well how hard that is to show. Um, it is a very difficult thing to do. But, you know, unfortunately, it's a competitive world. world so you've got to um, try and stand out in some way, shape or form. And that's the personally what's worked for me. Yep, I think that answers the second question as well, which was similar, similar to that. It's like how to start getting clients and work online in UX design. Well, look, I think there's ways for UX design, especially 
it depends how willing you are, but like, I think doing things for like helping people out, helping friends out to build some experience. Um, and then getting to the stage where I remember when I was doing some freelance work way back when, um, and I basically said, okay, it's going to cost you this much. And I charged them a pretty low amount compared to the market. And I also said, if you're not happy with the work for any reason, I will give you hundred percent of your money back. Um, and I got three clients that way. Right. And they were pretty happy with that. One of which wasn't fully happy. And I just decided to give them the money back. So I ended up keeping two of the clients work, but, um, and, and not everyone's in a position financially to be able to do things like that. But if you're able to give guarantees to clients and de-risk it, like it, it all comes into de-risking. And uh, I keep coming back to that principle, but, uh, the easier you make it for the person to hire you, the easier you make it for the person to make the decision and make them feel comfortable with the work you're doing, the better it is. Yep. Perfect. Um, great. Uh, just looking through other questions. So we have an ambassador program, kind of. We're building it out. It's called the Heroes Program. But if you're interested, definitely get in touch about that. Yep. Uh, why is Python not a part of data two and three curriculum? Uh, because we haven't gotten around to it. It's definitely <laughs> it's it's uh, it's in the pipeline, and we've also tried to make them as accessible as possible. Um, we're also trying to we're we're working on separating the courses because I think what's happened is that we just have two diverse opinions. We have half the people saying that the courses are too hard, and then half the people saying the courses are too easy, and so. We're now working on trying to separate the two. So we're trying to make a fast track and a slow track. The fast track will be a lot more intense with Python and things like that, which we're getting to. But ultimately, there's only so many things we can build. Yeah, on, on, on the same part, someone had also asked uh, in the signups, like, why why did we uh, you change the growth marketing course to digital marketing course? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it converted better. <laughs> that's That's all. <laughs> Uh, we're also rebuilding that one too. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Jeffrey says uh, there should be more collaboration aspect in the program so students can collaborate with each other and build build uh, something for themselves uh, well, while waiting for job opportunities. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out the right alumni balance and yeah, as you can see, the feature list is long and <laughs> we're we're working through them, but the alumni community is something that we're super interested in. Like how do we keep people working together and collaborating over a long period of time, building their portfolio, um, things like that. So ideally, once someone joins the entry level course, like they get part of the community lifetime access and they can work with people to to build things out. Um, we just need to figure out the right way to, to host that like on platform, whether that be Discord or something else, and then also monitor that over the long period of time. Yeah. Okay. One question that I have from before is if you could start over, what, what's one thing you'd change? <laughs> Damn, that's a, that's an interesting question. I, I think that's a tough question because if I knew what I knew now, then obviously I would shortcut the entire thing and build exactly what we need right now. But there's a lot of things we built that were wrong that we needed to fix, right? So that that's a hard question. I think I'm going to skip that purely because like hindsight 2020, I can just go back. And if I was a rewrite entry level from October 2020, 2020 then I think we would be right where we are right now in six months rather than two years, right? I think we would have shortcut the entire thing because I knew exactly what to do. Right. Okay, let me ask another one because what, like someone asked, what values have helped you strategically uh, in making like some key decisions and uh, maybe just like would love to hear a couple of mental models that follow the top ones that you'd like to share with others. Sorry, repeat that again. I was reading through the questions. What values uh, have helped you strategically? And I would like sort of reframe it as mental models, uh, how you see the world. So like maybe a couple of top mental models that you use uh, to make key decisions. 
Yeah, as you as you know, Ayusha, I have my mental model stored in a little Notion page for myself, which I haven't updated in a while, which I might. Um, and at some point, I do want to publish it. I, I have got a bunch of mental models just sitting in these like Notion tables. Um, but I think the ones that sort of like, s like stick out to me the most is like, I would say, let me scroll through this. I'd say first principles, like thinking about how to do things from first principles is always interesting. That's Elon Musk's uh, mental models. Um, the, okay, the explore versus exploit mental model, I think is really interesting. So a lot of people think about like opportunities, opportunities and exploiting everything that they can. And they jump too early into certain things, right? So they decide what they want to do at 17 or 18. But in actuality, like if you think about it rationally, like you need to spend a period of time exploring your options before exploiting the right options, right? And that explore exploit comes from the gambling fallacy. So like, you know, if you're trying to decide which machine gives you the best payout, you gotta try all the machines first, and then you find out this one gives you the best payout and you keep exploiting the one over and over again. So I think about that from a career perspective that you should be exploring as much as possible and not committing to anything just yet and discovering what you like and then make that decision. So that ratio is actually 37%. So if you wanna, you know, if you wanna get married by 40 and you have 10 years to get married, then you should spend 3.7 years to, like choosing and looking at different options before you commit. Um, and so the same thing with careers. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's the sort of the main ones. I've got a heap more, but like mm -hmm. I'll, um, I'll save that. You know, you'll see it on the entry level, level up newsletter at some point all the all the mental models yeah um what tips would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs who are figuring out if this path is meant for them or not yeah i, I think it's just experiment as much as possible just try things and just don't wait so one of the things i um actually this is a mental model too it's called the one hour validation um it's not really i, I just sort of made it up but the idea is that like you um you try to think about what action you could take in the next hour to make the needle move on your particular idea. So if you pick an idea and you say, what does success look like, right? Success is maybe make $2,000 from it, right? Um, and then you think about, okay, how would I do that in one month? And you write down the plan and then you decrease the time frame to one week and then you decrease it to one day and you say, okay, what can I do in the next hour to make this happen? Um, and honestly, every time I do a business, it always starts that way. It's just like, what can I do in the next hour? And to be honest, now when we have more people in the team, it could be detrimental because the way I think it's like, all right, guys, what are we going to do in the next hour to like grow the company? Um, and by the time it gets to the, you know, <laughs> the 12th or 15th person in the team, it's like, you know, you can't really do that as much. But uh, at the very beginning, that's one of the best things that I do. Nice. Yeah, that was a good, uh, good technique. Um, like next one's a funny question. <laughs> um, I mean, it's serious too, because it's, he's asked, Mac is asking, what's your like general time commitment currently? Because you manage a number of initiatives and well, companies. So do you live like Elon Musk? <laughs> no, I only work, I only work Monday to Friday and I only work, I'd say like 40 hours that's like excluding breaks. So, you know, if you include the breaks, then it's like 45, 46. So it's not even that bad. It's actually pretty, pretty manageable. In fact, my wife thinks I do absolutely nothing because I'm just in, in here the entire time on my computer. Right. Um, and then sometimes I'm like doing phone calls as I usually know as well, I'm walking. So like, I'll get my steps in and, and talk and things like that. So I don't subscribe to the mantra that you have to work a hundred hours a week to make a company successful. Um, I've done that in the past, like with my previous companies, I definitely gave up everything and anything to make it successful. But now, and we have this as a value in entry level, which is like, you know, not at all costs. And we don't, we don't want to succeed and like struggle, like basically die in the process. Like that's not what we want. So I don't want people achieving success in the team and, you know, working seven days, like, you know, and really putting in the long haul and like suffering in the meantime. So. That's, that's also why probably things take a little bit longer, right? It'll probably take 20 to 30% longer because we're trying to do it in a sustainable way and make sure we don't burn out. And um, ultimately, like, you know, we don't, we don't have churn in the company. No one's quit yet, which is, you know, touch wood. <laughs> no, one's, no one's quit the company yet, but 
I think we're doing an okay job in, in, in that way. Yeah, awesome. So next one's more of a UX uh, designer question. So Mohib says some businesses want the designer, what the designer designs to be live as well, like for him to build it. But how can a designer uh, overcome this problem if they're not uh, familiar with coding, but they could with design? So to build something, right? Yeah, it's like code the application or make it live. Yeah, just use uh, use Webflow or Bubble. Like there's so many no code tools out there that makes it so much easier. I think as a designer, Webflow, I'm such a Webflow fanboy. In fact, if I had to go work somewhere, like if, if entry level closed down tomorrow and I had to find a job, I would beg Webflow to hire me because I love that company. It's so good. And in fact, I want to buy a stock at that company, but I don't know how. Um, but Basically, the reason why I like Webflow is they're designed in a very similar way to how HTML looks, right? So, you know, when you drag across a, an element, it's like divs and containers and things like that. Very similar to how you would make a web page. So I think as a UX UI designer, you can design anything you want and all the stuff you want to uh, make on Webflow. And it actually makes it so much easier for you to communicate with developers when you want something built too. So I would do the like, in fact, I would love to do a Webflow course at some point, but we, <laughs> there's so many courses we want to do, but the Webflow time is always the constraint. Webflow, like if you're new to Webflow, like Webflow University is quite amazing as well, because the, the, the courses are like very funny, the instructors, and it's fun doing them as well. Yeah, it's, it's a very good course. That's also why we don't do it, because like Webflow University is a really good resource as well. So. Um, yeah, I would, I would learn that and become really good at it. And to be honest, you can start servicing clients that way too. You can build websites for them. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, and also I think Webflow, like when you create a website, it allows you to download the code as well. If you purchase one of the plans, uh, so like if you need the actual code as well, you can get that as well from the Webflow website and download the live code. Uh, DT says, uh, the Python yeah, I mean, that's a good tip, DT. It's like, uh, it's like having a data Python program focused on data analytics and for entry level people, uh, which can be helpful for us because there's many courses out there. Thank you. Uh, Lillian's asking any any tips for making our um, CV better and uh, more appealing. I would recommend Lillian to, I mean, if, if you haven't already, we had a workshop on resume building, resume and CV a uh, couple of weeks ago and the video is up on YouTube, I believe, or you can email us and we can send you the link because that has a lot of tips on uh, job search and how to build a perfect resume. I think, I think like high level thoughts of mind is just like make it stand out. Cause like you'd be surprised how little time people spend on CVs. Like they just scan it real quickly and they look for keywords and they move on to the next one, especially if it's someone I'm not going to out myself actually, but a imagine a small company like it's a bunch of applications and there's only so much time in the day to look at all those applications. They scan reading for a lot of things, right? So they're looking for something interesting. So, you know, I, I like to have a career, career summary at the top where it's like, these are the three things you need to know about me. These are the three coolest things I've done. Um, and I could read that and be like, cool, I'm going to either pass this guy or like, you know, put them uh, or um, put them into the next round. So I think that's how I would think about it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, where was asking, how can he get in touch with you in the future? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way. Just leave a note because otherwise it just all blends in. So just leave a note, you know, you attended this session, you want to connect and, you know, that's probably the easiest way. Okay. Is Webflow better than WordPress for SEO and SEM? They're about the same, like SEO and SEM just comes down to the technical side of SEO and SEM is purely like, um, you know, metadata and things like that, which you can do on both. Like there's no issues around that. And then the rest just comes down to how well you do your content, right? So it, it doesn't matter. Um, the reason why we use Webflow, so our websites on Webflow is because uh, the user experience is a lot better. And like you can do a lot more interesting things. And I think the design aspect of things makes it really clean. Like when someone gives me a Figma design, it's very easy to implement on Webflow because you can think like a developer and put it together. Yep. Awesome. Um, 
Are we planning any Web3 related courses anytime soon? We <laughs> we did a blockchain. We did a um, Web3 course actually at the very beginning. We did a blockchain one, but um, yeah, it didn't have as much interest. Although we still have the course, we could we could. Um, Mm -hmm. if there's people interested we'll we'll relaunch it <laughs> just just make some noise and if there's enough noise then i should be forced to do it because he's the one in charge of programs <laughs> yep comment everywhere and then our social media team will alert us um there's another question i think i missed your previous question uh what are some basic problems you faced when you started your companies uh like yeah Basic problems, I think, um, at the very beginning, it was, uh, you know, just figuring out which things like actually worked and which kind of worked, right? So, you know, we would launch an experiment and we did virtual coaching, for example, we had one purchase, right? Someone purchased the, the day that we launched and I said, oh, cool, that's awesome. Like someone purchased it. Uh, and then a week went by and no one else purchased it. So like, okay, is this, is this actually successful? Is it like a fail? And like, those are like the weird limbo points points. And then, um, we did this thing called future proof and that made like a thousand or $2,000 on a weekend. So we launched it on Friday and we made that much money. And we're like, okay, is this it? And then we launched entry level and that like blew up and we got 30,000 signups. So like, okay, that's actually the one, right? So it was deciding between what was kind of successful and what was actually successful. Um, that was like the the problem that I had, which is not, um, I, I guess might be a unique problem and maybe not things that other people face, but that's what I was personally struggling with. Wonderful. Uh, we have a offer for an intern. Uh, Precious is asking, can I, can she intern on our team? <laughs> Precious, when we are hiring interns, we'll let you know. But at the moment we are not taking any interns. We just hired two people, but I think we're not going to hire anymore, but Keep in touch. We may hire interns in the future, especially 2023. But uh, kudos for asking. Uh, you should always ask. Yeah, if you don't ask, it's not going to happen, right? So. <laughs> um, the discussion on uh, like a, uh, some uh, this person leads a co leads a product management team, and they have paid training and mentorship sessions that they launched via their websites. They have a couple of users that have onboarded, so they want to just like ask and get more tips on how do we upscale towards getting more subscribers. How to? Yeah, so I, I think to be honest, I wouldn't like the first question to ask is like, do you have fifty to a hundred like diehard fans? And I think like you can grind those like signups pretty easily. Like you don't need to growth hack that. You just post in groups like. If you, if you go back to some of these product management groups, you'll see a post from me in 2020, like, Hey guys, I'm doing a product management course. And like, I'm spamming every single group. You'll see my name there. Uh, if you scroll back. So, um, you know, the, it's pretty easy to get your first 50 to hundred. If you literally sit there and just post in every single Facebook group, every single WhatsApp group, you'll, you'll get that. Right. Um, and then if they really enjoy what you're doing, then it'll scale. Then you can figure out the scaling strategies from there. But I think the main thing is finding those like diehard fans that, are really excited about what you're doing. Yep. Uh, we already answered the second internship question and thanks Kausara for sharing the resume workshop link. If anyone's interested, you can click on that link and watch it after the session. Um, yeah, in terms of remote, most of our team is remote. I think we have two in Nigeria at the moment. Um, Ayush is usually based in India, but he's in Kenya at the moment and then uh, one in Canada. So we're all over the place at the moment. So yeah, definitely open to remote stuff. Um, can entry level uh, data analyst certificates get you a proper job without a degree? So I, I think with data jobs, the reason why data analyst courses are very popular is because data analysts, like you don't need a degree to get that job. You just have to be really good at handling data. So I think by the time you've done level one, level two, level three, um, and you've actually done some projects, then it's good enough to show off, then you can get those jobs. So um, the, to be honest, some of the portfolios I see on LinkedIn from uh, entry level students are actually very good. And I was talking to Amelia about, about this because she's the one who does that for our company. She does our data analysis in the company. And some of the portfolios are actually very good, like very similar to what Amelia does in her day-to-day -day job. So 
you know, if, if Amelia's not going anywhere, but if she wasn't there, I think I would hire one of these guys uh, that, you know, publish their portfolios. Um, so, you know, having a really cool tableau, a data visualization, these things are very good skill sets. And in data analysis in general, I think every knowledge worker today has to be really good at taking data, analyzing it, and making informed decisions because that's what you do all the time, right? Aish does that for programs as well, right? He's looking at the data, he's looking at the feedback, and then making informed decisions about what to do next. So whether it be programs team, marketing team, operations team, like Albert's still looking at like, you know, support tickets and how we're doing. So it's all data, right? So I think data analysis will help you in any sort of job you're doing. Exactly. Uh, and then this also answered. There was another question on data analytics course after getting a remote job after doing my data analyst course. So I hope this answers your question as well. Uh, there's someone asking, will the VC analyst have a level two as well, like data analyst? You can tell them the good news. <laughs> the Ugin answer. Yeah, yeah. Caleb is working on that right now. So uh, if you have feedback or thoughts around what you want for venture, venture capital analyst level two, let us know because that would be very helpful for us to build it out. What we are thinking right now is to dive more into the financial side of things around analysis. So, you know, valuations, things like that, and really do like um, deep dive on finances uh, because venture capital VC analyst level one is very much about pitching and pitch decks and sourcing deals and things like that. But like, we want to go a level deeper into analysis. Um, which we're currently working with some awesome mentors on as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you select individuals to build a team that will believe in your vision and mission? Yeah, <laughs> man, this is, this is a good question. The hard hitting questions. Um, I think it comes down to motivation as well, right? So like skill set is one thing that we look for, but we look for motivation and like, you know, interest in that particular field as well. So I've noticed my best hires generally like are fairly early in their career, like maybe don't have the right skill sets, but are building towards it and have demonstrated quick learning. So um, I, like, I won't say who specifically is like, but we've had team members who like, you know, had, had, a decent background, did a couple of courses in web dev and various things. And I said, look, um, I'll give you a month. If you can build this thing and I'll pay you for the month as a contractor, you're hired. And if you don't build it, then you know, you get paid for that month and we'll see how it goes. And, um, they ended up building a really awesome platform basically, right? Like for, for some of the stuff we wanted to do, um, we didn't end up using it, but I just wanted to see if they could achieve that in the month. And so. That was a really good way for us to hire. And the reason why I gave them the chance is because they were really interested in what we did. They knew exactly what to do, like what we were doing and like what we were trying to achieve. And it was very mission aligned. So um, we do test for that. I think that's a very important thing. And you can kind of tell after someone gets hired in the first month or two, if they're in it for the wrong reasons. Um, and you know, we're, we're a roller coaster startup. Like things don't work all the time. Things go wrong. We have you know, things that go haywire sometimes and, you know, we get customer complaints or we have a bad day or sales are down and we're trying to figure out how to improve sales. And, you know, if you're expecting like a smooth sailing ship, definitely not going to happen. Um, and, and you also have these scenarios where I'll, I'll even for each, I'll, I'll tell him one thing to, to work on something this week. And then next week we're doing something else and, you know, <laughs> we've got to pivot and, um, yeah. It, the mission is more important than all these other things. So as long as people are aligned, they will forgive you for the, you know, sometimes poor management or sometimes, you know, things are rough in the startup and things like that. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Fahim is asking, have we done uh, any of the courses offered by entry level? And if yes, which ones? I can answer that first. Um, I mean, I've actually like almost built half of the like v uh, product financial analyst scrum and ux i worked with the mentors to create those courses so i sort of know those courses by heart most of them the modules and the class um but then i have started doing the we I've, I've done all the other courses too really quickly but i haven't followed the tasks and like doing the tasks as well but i watched all the videos and read the content but i am planning to do the vc analyst course and the ux design course because 
I'm not good at design and I, I want to build that as a side skill set and we see analyst as well um, just to understand more about what to look for in companies. So those two programs, I'm going to sign up for them. Yeah, I've done, um, obviously done the growth one because I wrote it, but um, I've done the financial analyst one. I did not know what a pivot table was. Well, I knew what a pivot table was, but I didn't know how to use them until I did the course. And I was like, holy shit, this is this changed my life. Um, and now I use pivot tables all the time. I feel like with these courses, if you're not doing it for the sake of getting a job, for example, there'll probably be like two or three golden nuggets you take away that like change your life and the rest of the stuff is sort of like filler. But you know, that, that I took away and it was really interesting. Um, I did the blockchain one when we had it. Um, and I've done the product management one, the OG one as well. Awesome. I'm going to just go through the last couple of questions, but uh, wanted to say that we're going to be almost wrapping up in a few minutes. So if you have any last questions, do, do send them through. Uh, Jeffrey shared the link of the future with recommendation. Thanks. We pointed out there too. When will product management to be released? And will we be notified when applications for intern internships open? Yeah, this is a. <laughs> I mean, you can answer this, Ayush, but every every day we see our social media just being flooded with like, when when product management too? When is it coming out? And then Jennifer's just like sending in a Slack about how everyone wants product management too, um, which is Ayush's project. So I guess you can update them. It should be available by the end of the year. Or, well, we're working with David, who's our lead mentor, and uh, he's really keen on uh, uh, like, Doing the product management too, and uh, so yeah, we'll uh, we'll should be open for enrollments in November. I I hope. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of program changes coming. So and and don't worry if you if you bought a course with us, all of these changes will be done retroactively. So if we um if you update a course or significantly change a course and you've already purchased it, you'll get access to it anyway. So um yeah, we're tr we're trying to improve the content, trying to keep up to date with trends and. Um, we, we listen to the feedback and we look at the feedback and, um, so yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And yes, you will be notified if, and whenever we, uh, to, to have interns and, uh, the data analyst course question on, uh, again, including web the analysis and data querying. Yeah, we again uh, uh, for now we're just like restructuring some of those programs. So in the future you might see some of those. Um, but for the for the next few months, data courses will stay as they are. Uh, um, Umar is asking, he's suggesting that we should link people who finish the courses to sister companies who can offer internships so more on the recruitment side. Yeah, we um, we want to help promote internships and things like that. But one thing we've been wary of is not promoting unpaid internships or trying not to promote that because um, those are tricky and, and we it, it's also hard to verify those internships too, right? We don't know if they have the best intentions and for us to go through and verify every single internship provider that is out there and make sure that they're a legitimate company. Um, yeah, we also need to, if they're startups, we need to make sure they're legitimate startups and they're not going to take the students on for a wild ride. So um, we've been actually more afraid to release it purely for the, just making sure that students are not going to be taken for that ride, uh, which is why we haven't done it, but we're, we're looking into it, um, like doing a job sport and things like that. Wonderful. Isaac is asking, can he get good jobs with just the PM1 program? Um, I would say to that, you can get a job with PM1, but there are some some things that are not included in PM1 because we are um, like we waited what to include that more advanced stuff in PM level two, which is analytics, wireframing, and those skills. So you can definitely get a job with PM1. Uh, maybe more focused on the user research and discovery side, but uh, I would recommend you to uh, study a bit more until we launch PM level two, analytics and wireframing and road mapping. So you can do well in the interviews. And uh, last few questions, yeah. you wanted to add something, Ajay? I was just gonna say, like, I've looked at the portfolios, right? And for product management level one, um, there are some portfolios that are world-class and you think, oh, wow, like they could definitely go out and apply for jobs. And there are some that are sort of like, 
even the five stars there's a huge discrepancy between the levels of the portfolio so um, I think it just depends on what you create with that portfolio, right? Like you can either create something amazing and blow someone's, um, you know, knock someone's socks off and like get them really excited about it, or it's just kind of interesting. So, um, and I know that's not the right answer, like, because hopefully like the course trains you up to that point where you can just get a job, but, you know, because we're not a general assembly or we're not a company that, you know, charges $10,000 for a boot camp and like hand holds you the entire way, um, a lot of it, unfortunately, is like on you guys, right? So we try to provide the rails and we try to provide the support, but ultimately where you take it is up to you. Awesome. And last couple of questions. Can people still access the course after the program? And are we having, uh, do we plan to have an app anytime soon for so people can access their courses? there? Yeah, uh, on the access stuff, if you guys have opted in for the premium perks, you should have access. So if you're having issues with that, get in touch with support because they can sort that out for you. But if you requested the refund, then we remove access after two weeks because ultimately we have to monetize some way. So, you know, we <laughs> that's the that's the condition. So you can come in and get your refund and study for free, but then we take away the access to content after two weeks. So, um, yeah. Uh, what do you look out for resumes, experience of portfolios? Uh, and then a question about Discord. With the Discord stuff, please email support at entrylevel.net. They will definitely help you out um, with that stuff. I guess final question, Ayush, which will be the portfolio stuff. So, I mean, so the resume stuff. I would say I actually care more about portfolios than experience because you know, on the converse side of things, you have people with 10, 15 years experience that actually don't know how to do anything. Like I've been trying to hire like a, um, you know, a head of growth for a while and I just haven't found anyone that good if I'm being completely frank. Like I, I have a lot of people that apply with a lot of experience, but then they're almost too high level where they're, they're working with like 500 people. So they're not used to actually doing growth themselves and getting their hands dirty. And we're, we're such a small team that I need someone like that. So sometimes experience can be detrimental so i actually like to see someone's work and how they do it rather than experience but different employers could be different so um with the bigger employment companies obviously with the thousands of people um you know experience is definitely one of the things they look for so it can be tricky but when it comes to smaller companies you can definitely show off your skill sets in other ways through your portfolio so um and and i do recommend adding links to your portfolio in your resume yes or just submitting your portfolio. Awesome. Uh, for all the 50 of you present here, thank you so much for joining. But before we wrap up, I would like to hear how everyone's feeling. So one word to describe how you're feeling and put that in the chat now so we can see how everyone's doing and uh, we can do a see off. Yeah, thanks everyone. Really appreciate everyone's time sticking around for the entire, like over an hour. Um, there's definitely a lot more people than I thought there would be. And I'm surprised that the questions kept going for an hour. That was, that was awesome. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Uh, and yes, recording will be emailed to you uh, via email. And you can also find it on YouTube on our channel. I see a lot of people are excited and feeling great. So that's great. Mission successful. Uh, cool. I'm going to stop the recording now.